Welcome to ADMS 647 Educational Technology for Leaders. I'm Dr. Richardson and I'll be your course facilitator for this semester. And as I said in the text of the page, this uh, would represent what would be my opening lecture. I, I'm not a great lecturer. I don't lecture very often in my classes, but I do think it's important at the beginning of the course to give you some idea of where I'm coming from, the knowledge that I've constructed over time. So this is a sort of a pulled together presentation from a variety of different presentations that I often do but I hope it gives you some sense of, first of all, as the slide says, why we need a course in educational technology leadership at this time in, in our history. So, um, but the main title is Trust But Verify, a mantra for the 21st century. And I th hope this will give you some sense of why it's important that we spend a whole semester together thinking about educational technology and thinking about your role as a leader of educational technology in your school. So I used to be somebody who thought, you know, I'm not excited about all this hype over 21st century skills. I don't think 21st century skills are any different than as you see from Ben Franklin, 18th century skills. And I very much agreed with Andrew Rotherham. Rotherham is um, an educational technology policy guy. He works in Washington, D.C. and does a lot of work in, in policy and particularly education, but he also focuses on technology. And when I read this quote, I found myself very much agreeing with Roth Rotherham. Um, as you read through the quote, his essential idea is that last sentence. Yes, there are skills that are needed. We need more highly skilled workers than we did in the past. But the fact of the matter is none of these skills are unique to the 21st century. And my argument would always be that Benjamin Franklin had what were would have might have been considered 18th century skills in that he was a great communicator. Um, he was involved in the media. He ran a newspaper. He was involved in politics. He was an inventor and an entrepreneur. And these are all skills that we continue to hear are 21st century skills. And in fact, if you look back at leaders throughout the hi history, you'll see that they often had those general categories of skills. I also come from a somewhat cynical point of view when it comes to educational technology, having spent some time reading Larry Cuban. Cuban's very famous quote from 1986, just as the computers were starting to get into schools, Cuban wrote a book about um, technology and teachers. And his famous quote from that book is that technology won't change anything about learning until teachers change the way they teach. Uh, and he pointed out pretty much what this particular diagram suggests. This is Gartner's hype cycle diagram. And so um, Cuban applied this to education. There was some kind of technology trigger. And Cuban goes all the way back to um, chalkboards and the radio and um, overhead projectors, the, the old gooseneck overhead projectors that we all had. He looks today at things like MOOCs, massive open online courses that are being run by universities like Stanford and MIT. Um, he looks at things like QR codes, those odd little black and white square codes that you will see people say are going to revolutionize education, mobile devices, iPads, and those kinds of things. Those are technology triggers. And then there's this period period of real hype when this is going to be the technology that revolutionizes whatever field. In our case, it's education. The chalkboard was thought to revolutionize education. Um, there's a famous quote by, by Thomas Edison that once movies become commonplace, we won't need teachers anymore because kids will just learn by watching movies, radio, as I mentioned, and, and so on and so forth. And you can look at every kind of technology as it comes out, and it's going to revolutionize education. We go from there to the trough of disillusionment. And in terms of education, Cuban documents quite well that what happens is after the hype comes the time when, yes, teachers do adopt the technologies, but it's not the technologies that change the education, it's the teachers who change the technologies. And so consequently, you will go into classrooms now where, sure, every kid has an iPad. And what are they using it for? 
electronic worksheets or they're using it to respond to polls and and you know click in their answers on a poll or they're using it to take a quiz online and none of those are bad uses of technology but certainly kids taking quizzes isn't any kind of revolution in education. It might make it easier for the teacher to grade them. It might make it easier for the teacher to track the students who are struggling and track the questions that the students struggle with. But nothing about using an iPad to respond to a quiz is revolutionary. Education hasn't changed. We've adapted iPads in order to use them in the classroom in ways that we've always used a variety of technologies and then you could see from there we move up a little bit so there might be some teachers who make some changes who actually use iPads as the mobile devices that they are who send kids out in the world to collect data with their iPads or take pictures with their iPads um, or do collaborative work with their iPads that they might not have been otherwise able to do and then we move into the plateau and they become something that while they were rev perhaps revolutionary at the beginning are now just commonplace um, it, you know computer labs when I first started teaching were a very revolutionary idea taking kids to the computer lab to do work on computers or on the internet and now some 25 years later you don't think twice about computer labs in a school um, although the interesting piece is that many of them are being broken up now but but it, it, it has become a commonplace technology same thing with showing movies in classrooms the same thing with a variety of other technologies that we have smart boards interactive whiteboards are a perfect example and we've they're ones that we've seen them as the trigger and now we've worked them through and I believe we're very much at the plateau of productivity when you start talking about an interactive whiteboard um, and so so this is kind of the background of of the thinking that I've lived through in the in the some 25 years that I've been involved in education and educational technology but let's think a little bit about those skills that we talk about and I've outlined here for you um, several different people who have commented on the 21st century skills Tom Friedman in the world is flat talks a little bit about the kinds of skills that students are going to need in the 21st century and as you look across his top there that middle one if you haven't read the world is flat it's still definitely worth a read it's a little a little old um, but he says CQ plus PQ is great greater than IQ and what he means there is that your curiosity quotient plus your passion quotient is greater than your intelligence quotient so give me a kid who's excited about things who's curious to learn and and I can do something with them and in this world that may be more important than how smart you are at least as tested out by some kind of intelligence test the 21st century skills were first put together by the partnership for 21st century skills they've been boiled down now to the four C's that I talk about in the introduction to this course critical thinking communication collaboration and creativity are kinds of their their skills versus knowledge um, we've lived very much through a time in which we've been testing what kids know now we're starting to think about what kids need to do a while ago I read a Google blog entry where Google was talking about what they looked for in terms of employees and I pulled out a couple of those skills and then finally um, Tony Wagner wrote a book on um, the global skills that students needed this the seven survival skills and they're there now I've tried to organize these by kind of discrete skills um, being able to communicate being able to analyze information that's the first column the middle column are more of the critical thinking skills being able to use knowledge to solve problems there's also a little bit of creativity and innovation in there as well
And then that right-hand column are, are more people kinds of skills. Um, Friedman says you need to learn to like people um, and get along with people. Interpersonal skills, the ability to collaborate. Google very much focuses on people who are team players. This picture of computer programmers off in their darkened rooms working alone is not one that Google wants to perpetuate. They very much focus on collaborating with other people to come up with great ideas. And then Wagner mentions that word that I mentioned in relationship to Benjamin Franklin, and that is the notion of being an entrepreneur. Um, we very much live in a time, and, and this is one of the big differences moving into the 21st century. My father worked for the same company for 47 years. They, they hired him right out of high school. They put him through college. He got his graduate degree for them, um, and he stayed with them through his entire career. They pay his retirement now. They pay his health insurance. And the company was very much involved in his life. His daughter, me, who um, is 27 years younger than he is, um, hasn't worked for the same company at any time in her life for more than eight or nine years. I was in K-12 education for 13 years, but that represented two different schools. Um, I moved out into the consulting business, as it were, and did some soft money grant work for a long time. And now I work for the Virginia Society for Technology and Education as their part-time executive director, but I also do a lot of teaching online because I think it's important for me to keep that connection with education um, as a teacher and then I also do some plain old consulting work um, and helping school divisions with technology planning and so on and so forth and that's really the one place where things are very much different now than they probably were for the previous generation the way that you are going to do your work I do all of my work essentially from home um, using the internet as the way of collaborating with people so those are the different skills now my argument has always been that these really are just leadership skills and as Andrew Rotherham pointed out at that quote at the beginning it's just that we need more people to have these leadership skills we need more people to be able to think on their feet and you see companies like the Marriott hotel chain who allows every employee from the lowliest janitor up until to the CEO to have a certain budget they can work with so that you know when when the cleaning lady walks in the room and the person at the hotel is upset about something she doesn't have to say well I can't help you with that she can help them with that and she has a budget at her disposal so if they need you know additional stuff she is able to take care of that without having to work through the chain of command everybody in that company has been endowed with a certain level of leadership so so these are leadership skills and I look back at a leader that I really appreciate who is Warren Bennis and again Bennis was writing in the 80s and the 90s long before the internet hit the scene and if you look at his list of skills they look like 21st century skills adaptive capacity that ability to learn as you go along learn learn to learn as as it were um, integrity passion daring there's um, the distinctive voice and there's that curiosity quotient that Friedman talks about there's that passion quotient that Friedman talks about so I think you can make an argument that we call them 21st century skills but they really are leadership skills now I really believe all that and I continue to believe all that and then I got an email and it was during the first Obama's, Obama's first run for the presidency. And we have a very conservative aunt who loves sending out those emails, the ones that, you know, um, talk about different different kinds of things about the president. Um, his, his birth certificate was an issue. Um, there was one I remember that included a picture of Michelle Obama in this outrageous tie-dye dress. And, and it didn't take you very long to recognize that it had been photoshopped and it had been manipulated. You know, we live in a world in which photoshopped is now a verb and you find yourself questioning every graphic you ever see and and so my husband would reply back to her and he would he would quote snopes.com the website that checks out these legends and and she didn't really care that much she was doing it more out of fun she told us but the fact of the matter was that there were people who believed the information that she was sending out to them and and that trigger in me this notion that while those skills are 
our leadership skills, we really do need people to have very strong critical thinking skills in this world, or else they end up getting trapped in a cycle of misinformation, in which I got it in my email and it was sent by a good friend of mine, it must be true. And they don't do any kind of fact checking. And in fact, they forward it along to yet other people. So we, we have the power at our hands to disseminate misinformation in a way that we never could before. Um, and so it, you know, it, it turns into a a problem for us because, and I'm just going to skip ahead to a slide and then I'll go back here, um, it turns into the Shirley Sherrod case. Shirley Sherrod worked for the United States Department of Agriculture for her entire life and she had worked her way up from working in the Georgia office where she worked very closely with poor farmers um, and she and she did a lot of great work and now she was in the DC office again doing terrific work and all of a sudden a video showed up on YouTube and it was Sherrod talking to um, folks I believe at the NAACP about her job as 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 an African-American woman who had moved through the civil rights eras up until today and the little snippet of video seemed to be somewhat negative in terms of the work that she had done with white farmers in particular in in Georgia. It was about two and a half minutes long um, and the White House got this notion that it was going to be outed by some conservative bloggers um, later that day and they wanted to be seen as being proactive in this and they fired her. No explanation, they just fired Shirley. Well what happened was within minutes of the video, little snippet of video being released, someone found the whole 30 minute video. Somebody else went and talked to some of those white farmers in Georgia that she had talked to and they said, oh my gosh, I couldn't have survived without her. She was so helpful to me. She did things to me that, that for me that, that no one else had ever done. We welcomed her into our home. Um, whatever she says in that video is simply her reflecting on her life and it, it doesn't reflect her professionalism and the work that she had done. And so what happened was we had people in power who were, were misled by misinformation and felt like they had to act very quickly. And here's Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, telling you what he learned. And what he learned is that you don't make snap decisions based on something that you see on the internet. And that's where the 21st century puts a real pressure on those leadership skills in a way that it hasn't done before. Because we can share information almost instantaneously to in t literally the entire world, we have this sense that we need to move very quickly with things. And we don't take the time we need to communicate with people, to collaborate with people, and to apply our critical thinking skills because we're acting out of our gut rather than taking the time to think through the decisions that we're making. And so I think Vilsack's quote here is probably the the biggest piece for me that said, yes, they're leadership skills, but they're, they need to be applied in the 21st century context. Let's go back one slide. If you don't recognize it, this is from, um, from the horrible... Um, uh, golf accident that happened several years ago where where um, an oil deep rig oil well broke and was spewing for months was spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico. I point this one out because these are the kinds of problems that we and more importantly our students are going to be encountering and and these are very much 21st century issues we've seen oil spills before but not ones of this magnitude and not ones that had occurred in a place where it was very difficult to do the work um, and the fact of the matter is these deep 
rig oil wells were built without really adequate knowledge of how to fix a problem if it happened. They didn't have a backup plan or they had a backup plan and it only survived for one or two days and then quickly they discovered that they didn't know how to solve this. And so we spent a whole summer watching this oil just spewing into the Gulf of Mexico and watching scientists try to figure out how to solve this problem. These are the kinds of 21st century issues that our students are going to be facing. So while, they're, while their skills may be the same as those in the past, the problems they're encountering seem to have a very much um, 21st century urgency to them. We've seen it in Virginia. This was the textbook from the Five Ponds Press that had all kinds of, of errors in it, just honest to goodness mistakes. We tend to think of our textbooks as being the place we go for facts, and now we have the ability to do a lot of fact checking, and what we discovered was this textbook was flat out wrong. A lot of what our students were being taught was just wrong. And so we, we had to look at how this had been adopted, why it had been adopted, what had happened in our system that led to these kinds of problems. And this is the kind of critical thinking that our students are need, to, need to be putting into place as well. And then just a couple of pictures of, of people that, that, again, let us see that we really need our critical thinking skills. That top picture is Rachel Maddow. It's Meet the Press, which is a, which is a news show. And yet on it is Rachel Maddow, who is very much very left in her thinking. Dick Armey, who is very much right in his thinking. And they're debating each other. But you have to understand that each of them is debating out of their own particular ideas and their own particular approaches to the world. If you don't know where they're coming from, it becomes more difficult to understand why they're saying the things they are. Down in the left corner, that's Ariana Huffington used to be a Republican, now very, very liberal, runs the Huffington Post. And when you go to the Huffington Post website, they do not announce to you at the top of the page that they're a very liberal publication. They purport themselves to be a news publication and you have to do some digging to discover that they're coming to you from a very left-leaning view of the world. Other side is Matt Drudge. Matt Drudge is the opposite of Huffington in terms of his politics. Very conservative, very Republican. Um, and, and they tend to be the extremes of this. But if all you ever read is the Huffington Post, you forget that you're seeing the world with lenses on. Ditto for the people who read the Drudge Report. They're seeing the world with lenses on. And what we're discovering about how people use all this media is they don't use it to get the why ranging points of view, they use it to read only the people with whom they agree. And so it's important that we help our students learn that good critical thinkers look at all sides and then use those to construct their own answers to particular problems. So I really like Valerie Strauss, who writes for the Washington Post, but she tend, the part of the reason I like her is because she tends to have my somewhat liberal point of view. Jay Matthews, on the other hand, tends to be more conservative, and he often irritates me on a regular basis, but I still read him because it's important to me that I hear all sides of the issues in this world, and that's really one of the other big differences that we face. Just a couple other quick comments here. One of the great things about the internet is that we're able to engage with some very, um, very important thinkers in our time. So I mentioned Larry Cuban early on. Larry Cuban blogs on a regular basis. He's a, a professor emeritus now from Stanford University, but he has a very active blog where he's he's thinking about the news. He's applying his ideas and theories um, about education and educational technology to things that are going on in the news, to things that he's reading, to classrooms that he's visiting. And it's a great blog to read. Um, I'll include it in the area of our course site where I have links to people that you should be reading. Diane Ravitch, an educational historian. Um, Diane's made a big shift in her thinking over the last 30 years from being fairly conservative and Republican, a supporter of charter schools, a supporter of common core standards, a supporter of standardized testing, to being very 
much on the other side. She has seen what happened to those ideas over the past 30 years and she now uses her blog as a way to try to move us forward in more positive directions. And then at the bottom is a blog from Daryl. And Daryl identifies himself as a math teacher in California and you can get get a sense of his viewpoint from the title of his blog but I include that there because the other big difference now is that we all have a chance to say what we think we all have a chance to communicate our ideas outside of the lunchroom outside of a teachers meeting to the whole world and this semester you'll each have an opportunity to craft a blog where you write about the ideas that we're grappling with together um, and so it isn't just the famous people like Larry Cuban and Diane Ravitch who get to say what they think it's us as well and that makes it even more essential that we understand all the different viewpoints that are available to us how to pull those together to construct our knowledge and then communicate that knowledge to other people now what does this mean for us as educators well we can go back to Wig Wiggins and McTeague's ideas about knowledge and understanding we spend a lot of time with our kids on knowledge the states the presidents um, facts math facts science facts but very much what we need in this world is understanding how we use those facts to craft our understanding about the world how we judge what we think is right and what we think is wrong how we use those judgments to solve problems in the world I'm not one of those people who says we shouldn't teach them any facts because they can find them all on the internet we certainly have facts and information that we need to be able to use at our fingertips but we also need time in education to make sure that we understand those facts and then apply them to the things that are going on around us in the world. And I'm going to end with what's become something of an iconic picture, this baby with the iPad. And Steve Payne um, put the picture up on his Flickr account and it quickly, as I said, has become an icon for this age. Um, as teachers we often want to say our kids are too involved in media our kids spend too much time um, you know looking at the screen and texting and and all those kinds of things but this isn't going to change and and as educators we need to combat it in certain ways that hopefully I've already discussed through here in terms of helping them take a critical approach to what they're doing but if we're thinking that as educators by banning these devices from our classrooms and by telling kids that they have to engage only in learning in ways that we learned in the past we're doing them a huge disservice um, and that's why I think you see more and more schools doing things like bring your own device and that's something we'll talk about this semester and one-to-one -one programs because they recognize that devices like the iPad are very much the learning devices of the future my iPad is my textbook my iPad is my cookbook I use it for recipes my iPad is my recording device my iPad is my computer communications device when I use Skype on it or when I use it to record a lecture like this one um, these are the tools and the technologies that we have available to us and we can use them to support education we can use them to get up to that productivity plateau where we're doing things we couldn't do in the past but ultimately I think what we need to do is figure out ways to help our children become critical consumers and thoughtful creators and we use technology to do that but we also use the way we teach our kids to do that no technology tool is going to transform education unless we transform the way that we're educating our kids I'll leave you with that thought I'd love to hear your comments on this you can use the comment features down at the bottom of the page um, and and post them as we post our blogs you're welcome to come back and comment on this I'm really looking forward to this semester I'm looking forward to communicating and collaborating and learning with all of you as well